So in our next few videos, we're going to start talking about timers. Timers function kind of like a stopwatch. They let you measure how long something takes or make something happen at certain intervals. For example, here in this program, I have an LED blinking, but if you look at my code, you'll notice I don't have any delay commands in my while loop. I have a bunch of new registers that we haven't seen before, and I have an interrupt service routine. So I'm actually using timers and timer interrupts to trigger this interrupt at certain intervals and use that to blink the LED. So what we're going to learn will enable us to do things like this, but first we need to back up and look at a little bit more of the theory about how timers operate. So to start, let's just think about a stopwatch that you might have on your phone or on a wristwatch, something that measures time in hours, minutes, and seconds. So if you start this stopwatch, it's going to start off at 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. You start it, it's going to increment by a tenth of a second, and it's going to keep on going until it reaches something like 9 hours, 59 minutes, and 59.9 .9 seconds, at which point it's going to wrap around or go back to zero. So it doesn't have any more digits, it can't go to a time bigger than that. And then it's going to continue counting up again as if it had just started from zero. So timers on the Atmega 328P are going to have a similar function conceptually, except they're not measuring time in different units of hours, minutes, and seconds. They're just counting up a single number. It's not in seconds, but we'll get to that in a little bit. So the Atmega 328P has three timers built into it. We have timer 0, which is 8-bit, timer 1, which is 16-bit, and timer 2, which is also 8-bit. So two of these are storing an 8-bit number, and one of them is storing a 16-bit number. Let's take one of the 8-bit ones, so timer 0, and look at that as an example. So timer 0 is storing an 8-bit number, so in binary, that's starting out with just all 8 zeros here. That is the decimal equivalent of the number 0. It's going to count up to the binary number 1, which is represented as a 1 with decimal. Here's binary 2, etc. It's going to keep going until it gets all the way up to the maxed out value of all 1s, which is decimal 255. When it gets there, it's then going to wrap around back to zero and keep counting up. So I mentioned that we are not measuring time in seconds. Okay, great, what are we actually measuring in? To understand that, we need to talk about the system clock, which is a very precise 16 megahertz square wave generated by inter internal hardware in the microcontroller. So one period or tick of this clock is one divided by 16 times 10 to the sixth seconds, or 62.5 nanoseconds. So if we look at a square wave of this clock, one period from rising edge to rising edge or falling edge to falling edge is 62.5 nanoseconds. So that is our unit of time here, not a convenient unit that we would usually use to measure, but you can also just count in clock ticks. So this is one clock tick, but if you wanna to convert to seconds, you need to remember this conversion. So to explain this in a little more detail and visualize it, let's just talk about an imaginary 2-bit timer. So to be clear, the Atmega 328P does not have a 2-bit timer. As we discussed, it has 8 and 16-bit timers, but we're going to use the 2-bit timer just because it makes the numbers much smaller and easier to visualize. So imagine we have a 2-bit timer, so it's going to count up in binary 00, 0, 1, 10, 1, 1, or in decimal, it's going to go 0, 1, 2, 3, and then it's going to wrap around and go back to 0. So let's look at this graphically in terms of how it would relate to the clock signal. So here's our clock signal. This is just a square wave with rising and falling edges. If we line up our timer with this, and again, that graph was a lot to pop on the screen all at once, but let's just look at this one at a time. So in our graph here, we have the timer value on the y-axis. I chose to write it in decimal, but I could have written it in binary instead. And on the x-axis, we have two different labels. We have the number of clock ticks, and then we also have the corresponding number of nanoseconds. Again, remembering that one clock tick is equal to 62.5 nanoseconds. So if my timer starts out at zero, it is going to increment by a value of one at every rising edge of the clock. So I kind of get what looks like a staircase function here where I have my first rising edge, my timer goes up by one, timer holds its value until the next rising edge, timer goes up again until it reaches its maximum value. And then at that rising edge, it doesn't have anywhere to go. So I've maxed out my binary number. I only have two bits. One one is as big as I can get. I can't get a third bit. So it is going to overflow or wrap around 
go back down to zero, and then repeat that process. One thing to be careful about here, again, with counting, starting to count at zero, it can be easy to get this mixed up and be off by one. So the maximum value the timer can hold for an n-bit timer is two to the n minus one. So I have a two-bit timer here. The maximum value of the timer is three because I started counting at zero, but it takes two to the n clock ticks to wrap around. So it takes four clock ticks to wrap around completely or for one complete cycle of this timer. And if you want to convert that to seconds, you need to multiply two to the n times the period. So in this case, that's 250 nanoseconds. So again, this two bit timer was just for illustration. Let's go back to an eight bit timer and look at it with kind of a zoomed out view. So this is not actually a straight line. This is still a staircase function with 256 individual steps. We are just zoomed out far enough that we can't see them. So in this case, the timer is still going to start at a value of zero, but we are going to count up to two to the eighth minus one, or a value of 255, and then we're going to wrap around and repeat that process. So we kind of get what looks like a sawtooth wave here when we do that if we graph the timer value. And again, if we look at how many clock ticks it takes to wrap around, so the max value is 255, but it takes 256 clock ticks to wrap around, or 16,000 nanoseconds, so it might be a little more convenient to convert to units of microseconds in this case. It takes 16 microseconds for that 8-bit timer to wrap around. So there's one more thing we'll talk about with timers before we move on to actually programming them and looking at the registers we need to use and that is a prescaler. So a prescaler allows you to slow the timer down by a factor of n, where n isn't just anything you get to pick, you have to choose from a preset list of values, one, which is the default, so the timer runs at its default speed, or you can slow it down by a factor of eight, 64, 256, or 1024. So for example, if n equals eight, then instead of incrementing every one clock tick, the timer will only increment every eight clock ticks. So you have slowed the timer down by a factor of eight. Let's look at that graphically again. So if here in blue we have our clock signal for a prescaler of n equals one, this is what we saw before. The timer is going to increment by one on every single rising edge of the clock. But if I have a prescaler of n equals eight, then the timer is going only going to increment every eighth rising edge. So this timer is just going to hold its initial value for these eight whole periods here before it hits that eighth rising edge and then increments. So if I zoomed out, this would be a triangle wave with a much more gradual slope than this one. And increasing that end eight means the timer is therefore going to take eight times as long to wrap around. So in this case, it would be eight for an eight bit timer, eight times 16 microseconds, which is the wraparound time we'd calculated previously to give us a wraparound time of 128 microseconds. So that's a lot to absorb. Let's try and summarize it. So first, conceptually, just think about this like a stopwatch that wraps around when it reaches its maximum value. If you start getting lost looking at the graphs or thinking about binary, just anchor yourself and go back to that idea of a stopwatch that just starts at zero, counts up until it reaches a maximum value, and then wraps around. For an n-bit timer, that maximum value is going to be 2 to the n minus 1. The wraparound time is going to be the prescaler times 2 to the n times the clock period, where for the atmega 328 p the prescaler can be 1, 8, 64, 256, or 1024. And specific to the atmega 328 p the clock period is 62.5 nanoseconds. And again, specific to the atmega 328 p this could be different from another microcontroller. We have timer 0 and timer 2, which are 8-bit, and timer 1, which is 16-bit. So given all of that information, here is your first non-Tinkercad assignment. What is the wraparound time for a 16-bit timer with a prescaler of 1024? You should be able to figure that out based on the information on the previous slide.